three, <laughs> two, one. Any day. Okay. I don't know the ring. <laughs> I was waiting for her to do the thing. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. I'm, I'm still running the camera. Hello, and welcome to Anchor TV. Shot from the hub in beautiful downtown Cartersville, Georgia, the only show whose host is Mr. Bobby Lawrence. Hello, Bobby Lawrence. What's going on, Gordon? How are you? What in the world have you got on today? New format, new set, new set of threads, man. I got this tie, yeah. I got the kerchief, the shoes and the socks match the stuff. I figured I'd go classy, you know? Look at this. I leave here, I got the sunglasses to go with it. That's terrific. Is that your funeral going clothes or your church going clothes? Both. I'm not rich. Oh. I'm wearing <laughs> to funerals, to weddings, to, uh, to, uh, to this place, and to church. Oh, I got you. When I go to church. I'm the only one that wears this stuff when he goes to church, because it's kind of a a, uh, a nice laid back church, so sometimes I kind of stand out when new people show up, so I gotta figure out. Well, I thought you were just that. wearing that to try to impress our next guest. I am, actually, this is exactly what I'm doing. Who is our next guest, by the way? Pastor Grant Cole. Pastor right. Grant Cole. Okay. Hello. Yes. Hey. Good to see you. Yeah, good to be Please, here. Please, have a seat. Good to be here. Yeah, yeah. Pastor, it's good, good to see you. Good. Good to see see you. you. Yeah, man, this is wonderful. Man, I've been trying to get you for the longest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's been a little while. Yeah, <laughs> we had uh, uh, we had Greg Moss on last week. Oh my goodness! So this just is all worked out perfect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, he spoke about coming to the laundromat and beating you. Oh and, yeah, and yeah, so absolutely. That was really. Uh, uh, he did a good job, didn't he, Greg? Uh, uh, his his story is something else. In fact, it went two weeks, I think. Oh, and you're the author of. What's the name of the book? Into the Darkness and Out into the Light. Yep, First Peter 2, 9. He has called us out of the darkness and into the light. And uh, the reason I call it Into the Darkness is that when God put it on my heart to write that book, uh, I wanted to just, you know, share the testimony I usually share if someone asks me to share my testimony. Just give a brief description of what life was like before Christ and then all about what it's been like since. But uh, the Lord really impressed me that uh, I needed to share how I ended up in the situation I was in. So it's into the darkness and then coming out into the light. And I always tell people when they read the book, promise me you won't stop in the darkness. <laughs> I don't, don't stop there. Come on, come on out into the light. you got to promise me you won't stop. So. Well, 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 tell us a little bit about that darkness, if you don't mind. Well, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it kind of tells you about uh, how I ended up in that situation. It started out... Uh, innocent enough, you know, in my family. Yeah. Uh, my father was a big drinker. Uh, he would give me sips of beer when I was five years old. You know, at seven years old, I'm popping tops at the parties at the lakes and stuff like that. Um, you know, I got into a fight with a couple of kids, and, and uh, he seemed to really put his stamp of approval upon that. And so it was just these mixed signals, you know, from my parents. They would have never wanted the things to happen that did. And then when we moved, we were growing up. I grew up in a little town, uh, Tacoa, Georgia, up in North Georgia. And when we moved to the Atlanta area, uh, of course, the whole drug scene was going on. I was just in uh, the sixth grade, and uh, I just fell in with that crowd. And, you know, and it just one thing led to another, and I just got deeper and deeper into the darkness. Now, yeah. now if I remember correctly, when I heard you speak, you, now you went to prison for a while? Uh, well, three times. Three times. Yeah, oh, three times. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, uh, when I finally came to the Lord, it was my third time to prison. Of course, I'd been through five different drug programs. I'd been through, I'd read all kinds of books on self-help and got involved in a cult called Scientology, a lot of people have heard of, <laughs> looking for different answers, you know, but the answers I wanted to find. You know, that's what I, I was trying to make it work. Yeah. I was convinced I could make it work. And so after 22 years of drug addiction, uh, it was in 1990, um, they had just started giving out life sentences for drug charges in Georgia. Cobb County was the first county to do that. And uh, I was arrested. There was about 13 of us, I believe, that were targeted for life sentences. And uh, that got my attention. Wow. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's so amazing how when things happen, you think they're so bad at the time. But I, I've thought about it a lot. If I was facing 15 years, I wouldn't have repented. I wouldn't have. I mean, I'd just done two 12s and a one, you know, years before that. 
A two twelve and a one. Yeah, the, the second time. First time in prison, I had five sevens and a one. Second time in prison, I had two twelves and a one. This time, if they'd have given me 15 years, I wouldn't repent it. Now, 20 years, that'll get your attention. Okay, especially your third time going because, you know, now it's going to get an EH number. And that H stands for habitual. It means they're not trying to rehabilitate you anymore. It means keep this guy off the street as long as possible. You know, it's called habitual. But that life sentence, brother, that got my attention. Oh, yeah. That got yeah. my attention. I, I fell to my knees, and I cried out to God. And I said, you know, God, because I've always known God was there. I mean, he messed with me all the time. He did. He would mess with me yeah. continuously. And uh, But I didn't know you could have a personal relationship with him. You know, I looked at him like kind of like the Star Wars, you know, that force that's out there. Yeah. And um, But I dropped, and I said, you know, God, I said, I've been through, you know, this will be, my third stretch in prison. I've been through five drug programs. I just started pouring out all things I've done to try. And I said, please, God, save me. And uh, I didn't know what save being meant in the way that we understand yeah. it as Christians. I meant I'm drowning. You know, and I'm going to be honest with you. My attitude was either reach down here and do something or kill me, and I don't really care which one. And as soon as I cried out, please, God, save me, this, this blanket of peace just came over me. I mean, I knew that it was God because I was in a state of panic. I mean, I thought my life was over. And as soon as that peace came on me, I remember I looked across my, my bunk there in my prison cell and there was a bunch of papers stacked up. And it was almost like something was radiating on and off like a neon light. And I reached over and I grabbed out this book and uh, it didn't look anything like a Bible. It had an American heart on the front of it. It said, Good News America, God loves you. The New Testament. And I remember looking at that and I thought, the New Testament, doesn't that have something to do with the Bible? <laughs> and uh, so I opened it up and I began to read. And the second time I was in prison, I tried to read the Bible. I was in a cell with nothing but a Bible. I couldn't understand anything it said. And uh, I remember, though, I, I got to a part where uh, Jesus said, Woe unto all you lawyers and hypocrites, and who lay men's souls with burdens you wouldn't touch one of your fingers. And I remember that time I threw the Bible down and I said, finally, me and God agree on something. I hate my lawyer too. <laughs> but anyway, this time I opened it up, man, I could read it. I mean, I understood it. I mean, it was a New Testament, so I'm reading uh, the genealogy. And I'm like, look, fascinated. Because I'd heard of David, and I'm going, is that the King David that killed Goliath? I mean, somewhere I'd heard yeah. about that in my history. And then, you know, talking about Solomon, I'm thinking, man, was that the rich guy? You know, was that David's son? And all of a sudden, I began to think, you know, this must be one of those easy reading Bibles. You know, I've heard about those in prison. You need to get an easy reading Bible. And so I looked at the front, and it said King James Version. I said, yeah, it must be an easy reading Bible. I went to find, who is King James to? I need to figure out who he is. <laughs> and so I just poured myself uh, into the Bible, and and I remember I'm reading it all night long. And, they, of course, they turned the lights off. And in my prison cell, there was a, there's like, in the Cobb County Jail, there's these long, slim lights. And the search lights kind of put a little beam coming into your cell. So I'm in there, man. And, I mean, I've read through the Gospels, man. And I've gotten to the Gospel of, of John. And as I'm reading through, you know, I'm beginning to pick up on what's going on. Here you had Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I, I had no idea why he died on the cross at this time. It didn't make any sense to me. But he was walking the earth, and he was, he was only speaking good things, okay? But you had this other group of people over here, these Pharisees and Sadducees, who I didn't really understand them either. But they were doing their own thing, and they didn't like what Jesus yeah. was doing. And so, you know, as far as they were concerned, you could just crucify him. And as I began to read where they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him, it was like I felt that spirit that must have been there. I've been in a prison riot before. It's kind of like what you see going on in the news now with the riots oh, yeah. and the burning. Oh, yeah. This is a spiritual thing. It's like a wind that blows, that catches you up. And that's what a prison riot is like. And so it's like I just felt what must have been the atmosphere. And I remember I took that Bible and I threw it down on my bunk and I said, Lord, I said, I can't believe those people back then were that wicked. And all of a sudden, it hit me. It was like it was like God just hit me. Listen, I'd heard about Jesus Christ. I'd heard about the stuff he did. I can't remember where, but I'd heard about it. But you know what? I didn't care. As a matter of fact, as far as I was concerned, you could crucify him. And all of a sudden, it hit me that I was like the most wicked people I'd ever read about. It was the first time I ever realized 
that what I was doing was really wicked. Oh, yeah. And let me tell you something. He, that, you know, isn't it amazing how you can spend all those years and go through all that stuff, but God will give you one revelation, one light of understanding that can completely change your life. I mean, at that moment, I decided right then, I was never doing drugs again. And I mean, and I kept thinking to myself, somebody needs to come in here and whip the tar out of me because I deserve it. I mean, I'm talking about, you could have, I, I was telling God, I said, they can put me in the electric chair and I'll never get high again. I mean, it turned me upside down that one moment. Yeah. And so I kept reading, right? And so I get through the Gospels and I get through the book of Acts and I hit the book of Romans. And I'm talking about now it's about daylight. <laughs> And I realized, man, I'm not reading stories anymore, right? I'm into some deep stuff. And I get to where God's talking about the difference between law and grace. Now, I didn't have a clue what grace was. Now, I ended up in a prison cell the first time I was in prison, and Amazing Grace was written on the wall, and I had nothing else to do, so I memorized the song. I mean, everybody in prison knows Amazing Grace. Nobody knows what it means, but we all know what the song is, right? And... Uh, so I'm reading about the difference between law and grace. I don't know what grace means, but I can tell it's better than law. Amen? Yeah. And I'm yeah. under it, whatever it is. And about that time, the cell door opens, and they had church call. Well, I didn't know they had church call in, in jail, and it's like they're trying to hide it because it was before daylight. Everybody's still asleep. Nobody's up, but they give church call. So I get out, and I go to that church service. And... Uh, uh, they chain us all together, you know, and we walk into this room, and there's this guy there he's going to speak to us, and I knew he was a cop. You know, like, I mean, I could tell a cop about the way, right? And I thought, man, what's the police doing the preaching? <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'd always, my idea of church, I'd seen movies where you went into a confession, I thought, I know what it is. They're going to try to get us to talk. <laughs> and uh, it's the truth. so I, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, there's something funny going on here. And there was this lady, she's very well known around here, named Libby Weatherby. She was a country singer who learned to, who, who got saved and began to sing the gospel. And man, she was singing like an angel. I felt the presence of God. And the first thing this guy did is he got up and told us he was an ex-police officer. And that he got saved. And now he was the chaplain of the jail. And here's what blew my mind. It's like when I was reading about the difference between law and grace and not understanding it, somehow, Bobby, God let me know that my whole life was changing right there that night. Without understanding how it was happening. It was like God had given me a peace that I didn't have to worry about the police. I didn't have to worry about the court system. I didn't have to worry about my family. I just had two young children. I was already caught carrying the guilt of a younger child the first time I went to prison that wasn't I wasn't there for him. And he was he just put it across to me. I was starting everything new there. Well when that guy got up, here's what he said. He explained to me that the reason Jesus Christ died on that cross was so that I could have that forgiveness I already knew I had. Okay, so it wasn't like he was teaching me something to look for. Yeah. He was explaining to me what had already happened to me by myself in a prison cell with me, the Bible, and the Holy Ghost. And then he said these words. He says, if you go through life and you don't care what Jesus Christ has done for you, you might as well be the people who nailed him to the cross. And I remember I just shouted out a cuss word. Because, I mean, I was amazed. I said, oh, and then when I did, it was sounding dirty. And I thought, well, that sounds dirty because I'm in church, right? But let me tell you, I said the sinner's prayer, you know, kind of put the nail in the, in, the, in, the, in the experience there. We walk back into the day room, and, of course, now everything's going on, right? People are up, expurlatives are flying everywhere, and every time I heard a cuss word, it sounded dirty. And then, of course, I cussed so bad, you know, I, they're coming out of my mouth and I'm cringing. And I actually had a man come up to me and go, man, what is wrong with you? I said, I don't know. All I know is, is I dropped to my knee in the cell last night, cried out to God, got a piece, read the Bible all night, went to this church service, some police preached. I done prayed and asked God to come to my life. Now cuss words sound dirty. <laughs> That's good. Uh, and let me tell you something. From that moment on, God started changing my life. And he gave me a hunger and a um, fascination with his word. And I imagine I probably read it more than most people because I had more time because I was in prison during the first time studying the word. And I, I'm more fascinated by it now than I, than I ever have been. And uh, there's just no end to the depth of it and the life-changing that it does in our, in our lives. Well, let, let me ask you. You said you felt like he was after you from the 
a long time. Oh, yeah. What, why do you think that was? Why do you think that was? Was there just that call, or was there somebody praying for you? You know, I, if there was someone praying for me, I don't know who they were, because my family was not into crime or anything, but they definitely did not know God. Okay. Um, my father was one of those guys. He was a businessman, never, you know, never was really there. Like I said, drank a lot, you know, and uh, uh, he knew that there was a God. He knew that this country was great because of biblical principles, but no, no church background. But um, God has a call, you know, upon people's lives. And, uh, but I'll tell you a little story. Um, when, when my father, uh, when I was born, my mother wanted to have me, um, you know, christened in a Methodist church in the town in Tacoma, Georgia. And so there was a joke, a family joke, that when they christened me, that the pastor held me up over his head and started walking around the sanctuary talking about, here is a pastor. I'm carrying a pastor. And my dad didn't know if that was just part of the service or what. And uh, when he came out, everybody was, was joking about it, like of all the people's kids to do that with. That pastor doesn't know what he's talking about. Of all the pastor's kids, I mean, of all the people's kids to do that with, why would he choose you? Because my father was known for throwing big parties. Um, James Brown would come and sing. He was, uh, back then he wasn't famous yet. He would come and, and do parties at the lake, and they'd throw moonshine. I mean, he was just a big party guy. And James, uh, no, wait a minute. James Brown. He was a janitor in a Tacoa High School and met my mother. Really? Yes, and uh, my father had a real affinity for African-American people. He was a vice president of Wright's Manufacturing Company, and whenever he would meet different people that needed help, if he couldn't get them a job in the plant, he'd bring them to our house and just let them work in the yard and stuff like that until he got them jobs. So um, he just knew a lot of them, and so they would have parties. James Brown took me up on this pavilion, and we poured um, baby powder all over the floor, and he taught me to do the twist. No really? joke. Yeah, and they were throwing moonshine on the lake and throwing matches in it, and that's how the bonfire would burn. Apple brandy and all this stuff. So anyway, so it was a big joke that I was the one, that he was the one whose son did that. And so, of course, when I really got into my life of crime and so forth, and once you go to prison, you know, everything's out there. And it was always a joke in the family that, you know, yeah, you're the one they, the pastor said would be a pastor. So he was prophesying your future. He did prophesy. <laughs> that's the only one I know of. That's the only one I know of. Man, that's wow. And now, so... So now you were serving a 20-year sentence then? Okay, well, the first time... Or life. Then. Okay, well, I was facing a life sentence. And uh, like I said, they had targeted 13 of us uh, uh, for a life sentence. My lawyer came to me and said that the only um, uh, plea bargain they would give me is that I would plead guilty for 30 years, which is the same thing. Other than that, they were taking me to trial. Um, you know, I thought I was real smart. I had all these plans. Like, I would do stuff like I had code cards, and we could communicate on beepers without speaking through numbers. And, and of course, the police raided someone's house and got a code card and can decipher these messages. And so they were proving that I was a career criminal, you know, that I wasn't just someone who got busted again, but it was my way of life. And so they just had all this on me. So... You know, I'm going to plead guilty for 30 years. I mean, that's the same thing as a life sentence. The only difference is, is one day you'll get off parole. You know, you're not going to do any more time on life sentence if you're that. And so when I, that's when I came back into my cell was after talking to my lawyer, who was, I won't say his name, but he's the best-known drug lawyer in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, he's like the Bobby Lee Cook for drug addicts. If you <laughs> murder somebody, you hire Bobby Lee Cook. Yeah, I got you. If you're a drug addict, and if anybody listens to us and one, they know who he is. But anyway. I gave him all that money, and he's telling me that. See, lawyers usually lie to you. <laughs> they come in and say, oh, no worry, man. I can take care of this. I, no, he's telling me, man, this is it. And uh, so I just went ahead, and I did have some old uh, probation left from the previous sentence. I said, look, just waive it. Send me into prison. You know, because I, I found out the difference. You know the difference between having an expensive lawyer and a court-appointed attorney? Okay. <laughs> With a court-appointed attorney, you just go to court and get your time. When you hire a, a really good one to pay him a lot of money, you go to court, 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 and then you get your time. So I knew I was going to get to go to court for a few years. And uh, so, uh, so uh, I went ahead and just waived all my rights and went on, went on into prison. You know? and, uh, but God had other plans. I mean, do you want me to tell you about it? Yeah. Okay. Man, yeah. You're interested? So, yes. <laughs> all right. So, so while, I'm, while I'm in jail, this happens the day I come back from that first church service, right? I come back in there, and I'm already amazed because something's going on, right? I don't know what it is. And all of a sudden, they yell, the Gideons are here. 
Well, I, you know, listen, I, I would go into motel rooms and I would pull out that Gideon's Bible and I would lean it against the curtains to make sure nobody could peek in there. So I knew what the Gideon was was on a Bible, but I didn't know anything about them. And so in my mind, I'm thinking there's going to be these long, white-haired guys like from, uh, you know, some kind of mystical movie. They're going to be glowing out there, you know, like, who? Are, what are the Gideons doing in jail? Floating. Uh, yeah. And so it was amazing. All these guys line up, and they're getting Bible studies. And so I come to the door, and I look through the little hole, and there's a guy out there, and he does have a beard. He doesn't have long hair, but he is glowing. And uh, his name was Johnny Ferguson. He's going on to be with the Lord now. And so... I said, you know, you're bringing Bible studies in here. And I said, how much are they? Because, you know, I came out of Scientology. <laughs> Every time you buy a book, right. man, it's hundreds of dollars. You want to take class five grand. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. If I didn't give those people $30,000. Oh, no, it's no. expensive, man. And so I'm going, how much are they? He goes, they're free. I said, they can't be free. Who paid for them? And he said, Jesus paid for them. And I've just been explaining that Jesus paid for my sins. And I'll never forget looking at that old man through that crack in the door. And I says, man, Jesus pays for everything, doesn't he? And he says, he sure does, my son. He sure does. Hey, where'd he go? The rapture. He was raptured. You know, Kirk Cameron was right. I didn't put much stock in Kirk Cameron, but I do now. No, serious, man. That was a great interview, wasn't it? That was a good interview. We got to have him back. Man, I'm telling you, he, he can go and go. He's got... So many great stories. I'd love to have him back. You want me to read this? Yeah, good. This is from his book. This is uh, this is his kind of uh, testimony here. He was a top student from a loving upper middle class family. So how did he end up serving time in six different prisons, three separate times? This powerful memoir chronicles one man's remarkable journey as he struggles through various drug programs, studies psychology, and even looks to Scientology in a desperate search for answers. Finally. After finding himself threatened with a life sentence and void of any hope, God answers his prayer for deliverance. From the jailhouse to the White House, this journey is more than just a story. If you have a loved one who is addicted and or struggling to overcome addiction yourself, this inspiring book offers help and hope. And look, here's a picture. That's what he looks like 22 years ago. Hey, I'm standing here at Altoona Pass. Years ago, before the Civil War, a man named Sherman came through here surveying, and he was so amazed at the Southern ingenuity and how they was able to cut this uh, pass through this mountain here and uh, for a, a train uh, tracks. And during the Civil War, when he was in Kingston, Georgia, he knew better than to bring his troops through here because he knew it would be like shooting fish in a barrel. So he avoided this pass and he goes to Kennesaw. Well, after Atlanta falls, he comes back to Altoona Pass. Uh, Percentage-wise, they said the battle at Altoona Pass was the most bloodiest battle in all the Civil War. The Southerners felt like uh, the Northerners were trying to impose their will on them. The North wanted to end slavery and some other issues, too. The South was pretty wealthy because of agriculture. The North was uh, not so much of the... They, they wanted to raise the tariffs on cotton. And uh, again, the Southerners felt like that was Northern aggression. Um, and they, want, they believed in states' rights. Um, but something happened then. Instead of talking and communicating, they started reacting. And the next thing you know, they found themselves in the most bloodiest battle in all of history. In fact, even up to today, more people have died in the Civil War than all other wars combined. The city of Corinth was a, was a port city. There was much division going on. And Paul come to me and he said, Brothers, there's much division among you. I'd have you all saying the same thing. There was a lot of civil war going on in the church at the time. Paul writes him a letter later on, I think in the fourth chapter, the 14th verse. He says, I write this to warn you, brothers. He said, I write you not to shame you, but to warn you. He's, he's wanting to counsel them and uh, communicate with them. A lot of times when we don't communicate and we start reacting, we repeat history. I am standing at one of the most dangerous places that a human can stand, and that's right there on the train tracks. I don't know if you've ever seen a train going past and putting on their brakes, but you hear a loud screech. 
and all that weight, the tens of thousands of pounds pushing that engine down the track does not allow it to stop on a dime like maybe your car does. So when we walk this light, we're like standing on those tracks. We can be walking on that track and see that train coming and ignore it and say, I don't believe that that train can hurt me. And so as I'm walking down that track and I'm hearing that, that warning sound, whoop, whoop, and that train's coming, no matter what I think, that train is going to plow into me. Well, with Jesus, you can believe in Jesus or not. You can believe or not that he died for everyone's sins. You can believe that two, over 2,000 years ago that a man came to this earth in the form of God, God in the flesh, and took upon him the sins of the world because God is holy. You can think that you can get to heaven without being holy, just like that train. You can think that that train's not going to hurt you. But thinking isn't, isn't going to get you anywhere. It's believing upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believing that you're in danger. Believing that you need to jump off those tracks. Just like with Jesus. Believing that you need to ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Believing Him that He took the punishment for you. It's not a wishy-washy gospel. It's not a gospel of, oh, I believe Him and I'm still going to walk down those tracks because He's going to protect me because that train's still going to hit you. So I want to encourage you today as I'm standing in front of these tracks, when you hear the warning, and Ezekiel says that he, that, that he put a watchman on the wall, if a man dies in his iniquities, which is sin, which is not loving God, and you do not warn him, the blood is on our hands. But if you warn the wicked to jump off those tracks before the train hits him, and he jumps off the tracks, a soul is saved. But if you warn him and he keeps walking, then his blood's on his own hands. So today I ask you, are you going to warn the man walking down these tracks? In the paper south, south LA, another kid made the news, made the news today, took a gun to school. Anchor TV is videoed live in Cartersville, Georgia, and is viewer supported. If you like watching testimonies of how God is working in people's lives or would like to be a guest, contact us at our website.